So let's talk about Rush Limbaugh. Uh, yeah, uh, Rush Limbaugh, who uh, the 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 giant, the the talk radio show giant, uh, really uh, a person who created the medium, who changed media and political commentary in the United States forever. Uh, it will never go back to the way it was. Uh, he he was a um, he was an entertainer. He was a commentator. He attracted tens of millions of fans. He was funny. He was serious. He was angry. He was upset. He was a lot of different things. Uh, but he clearly, uh, and unequivocally, and in ways that I think are quite profound and that people will be analyzing for decades to come, he completely changed the media landscape of America. I mean, if you think about pre-Rush Limbo, there was no real constant, ongoing political commentary. There really wasn't Fox. The, the, the CNN was there, but nobody, nobody really watched CNN. Uh, there was a... Um, you, you could get... You could subscribe to, to magazines, uh, newspapers. You could read editorials. Uh, but there wasn't this, uh, you know, uh, media existent that we've had over the last 30 years, really, since Rush, where you turn on the radio and you stay on the same channel and you hear um, ongoing commentary on politics for hours and hours and hours and hours. And maybe you get home and you turn on Fox and you sit on Fox and you hear ongoing political commentary for hours and hours and hours and hours. And maybe over the last 10 years, 5 years, 10 years, uh, some of that has been replaced by Facebook and, and Twitter and the, and the online commentary have mo has moved to, to Facebook and Twitter. But the whole attitude of constant, ongoing politics, commentary, it just didn't exist. C-SPAN is not commentary. Somebody asked, when did C-SPAN start? I'm not sure. Sometime in the 80s. But it was never commentary. You'd watch the proceedings in the House, the proceedings in the Senate. Um, there was, uh, you watched the news, you got your local newspaper, you maybe subscribed, if you were conservative, to the National Review and to commentary and a few other magazines, and you read articles. You read op-eds by George Will and by, uh, by uh, um, uh, Bill Crystal's father, Irving Crystal, and others, and that was political commentary. But Rush turned political commentary into, if you will, spectator sport into entertainment, really into entertainment. And, and if you remember, there's a famous line Rush used to have. Uh, let me quote it exactly. He said, people turn on the radio for three things. Three things. Write these down. They turn on the radio for three things. You guys listen to YouTube channels for three things. Entertainment, entertainment, entertainment. And what Rush was a genius at is turning political commentary into entertainment. And he truly was, and this is why he was as influential as he was. He was truly brilliant at it. He could engage an audience for three hours with very little script. I mean, he had a staff that helped him prepare, but with very little script, and would talk and entertain and be funny and engaging, particularly in the early years, and keep a conversation going. He'd really have guests. He really took calls. It was just him talking into a microphone. He didn't have a co-host for three hours every single day. That's hard work. Now, I know because I try to do something like that. And those of you who are young and who only have heard Rush Limbaugh over the last, let's say, five, six, ten years, didn't really experience Rush Limbaugh at his peak, at his height, at his best, as a radio commentator, as, as an entertainer. I mean, that's the early 90s when he was at his best. Now, look, I never agreed with Rush on many, many things. He was always, to some extent, a political hack, 
a defender of Republican politics, a conservative and a, and a piece of religion, even though you never got the sense that he was very religious. Jennifer reminds me that Walter Williams periodically would uh, guest host a show uh, uh, for Rush when Rush was on vacation or something. But in the early 90s, Rush was really funny. I mean, he had some great segments that were unbelievably entertaining, powerful in the way he made fun of the left, but in a fun kind of way, not in the vicious, angry, hate, hateful, and maybe they deserve it, but vicious, angry, hateful way that I think his show evolved into. But in the early 90s, it was fun. There was the tuna. You remember the tuna commercials? You know, Johnny, come and eat the tuna. This tuna has dolphin in it. Oh, you know, this tuna is dolphin free. And I think the kid complains. Oh, the tuna doesn't taste quite as well, as good as it used to taste when it had dolphin in it. And uh, he'd, he'd make fun of, at the time, there was this big environmentalist scare about, oh, tuna cans have dolphin in it, dolphin meat, because they kill some dolphins when they catch the tuna. And there was all this hysteria about it. He made fun of the, he had this environmentalist corner that used to start out with the, with the chainsaw, starting up the chainsaw, and the big sound of a chainsaw. So big sound of a chainsaw and chopping down the trees. And he would go into his environmentalist corner, which were typically good, uh, engaging, and often funny. He had the uh, condom bungee cord. I can't even remember why he did condom bungees, but, but he had a condom bungee, making fun, I'm sure, of sexual promiscuity on the left. But he was good at what he did. And, and to the end, he, he was good at what he did. And I, I think in the 90s, he had integrity. Uh, he tried to try to shape the conservative movement, uh, and he had an impact. And he was also, generally in the 90s, he was a Reaganite type of conservative. He was positive. He was optimistic. He was energetic. He had a positive view of the future of this, this country. He made fun of the left, but he was never, he never had this attitude of viciousness towards all of his political opponents. He dealt with callers beautifully and brilliantly and, and amazingly. But something turned. It started really under the Bush administration where he became an apologist for everything Bush did. Post 9-11. He, he criticized any critic of Bush on any issue. And he would go after them. And he started to become angrier and more depressed and more pessimistic. Then, of course, with Obama, he really turned vicious. But the real turning point was Trump, as I think the real turning point for all Republican and conservative politics was Trump. Rush started out being very skeptical of Trump, mildly criticizing him after the early debates. And he got a big pushback from his listeners. And you could tell, as somebody very aware and alert as he was, to his audience, that he was taking note. And as his audience pushed back, he changed his tone completely towards Trump. And soon, he became one of Trump's biggest supporters, admirers, and he took on the tone of Trump, the angry, conspiratorial, world is coming to an end, vicious attitude. And as Trump won, and as Trump was successful in rounding up support among the Republican Party, really dominating support among the Repo Republican Party, Rush became a bigger and bigger and bigger supporter of it. Just as Mark Levin did, maybe the biggest extreme in terms of shift, 
was Glenn Beck, who, who literally campaigned against Trump in 2016, was anti-Trump in a way. I was on his show during that time when we had a conversation about Trump, and he was viciously anti-Trump. And he, too, was convinced by his audience. He lost a huge amount of his audience. Ultimately, he really lost his whole TV network. He lost his prominence as a conservative, uh, as conservative uh, radio talk show host and a, and a video talk show host, uh, Glenn Beck did, uh, because of his lack of support of Trump. And, uh, you know, as a consequence, uh, he had a shift. He had to alter. He had a completely turn. And again, uh, you know, Glenn Beck became one of Trump's biggest supporters. So sadly, I think Rush ended angry, pessimistic, conspiratorial. I never got the sense of conspiracies. Again, anger and, 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 and defeat from him in the early days. But he certainly reflected that in the old days. I, I listened to him a little bit in the 90s. I, I never could listen a lot. Who has three hours during the day to listen? I'd listen in the car when I drive to campus and back as a student, then a little bit when I was a, when I was a professor. But the hours would never, would never fit. When I was working, I was working. In the evenings, I didn't want to spend listening to politics. Still don't. He, uh, I listened to him a little bit in the years later on, segments here and there. Um, his just ability to command the medium, his ability to command his audience was always impressed me. Even when I disagreed with him, I was amazed at how good he was at his craft, how competent he was, how engaging he was, how he held that audience. So uh, in spite of our differences, I have an immense respect, had an immense respect for him. Sad, uh, you know, to see him passing away uh, at a relatively young age uh, for these days. But he did, he did smoke. He did smoke cigars um, well late, and he did die of lung cancer. Um, so it's sad where he landed up. I find it, but, but that's, that's where conservatism and the Republican Party landed up, and it's sad for all of us that that's where conservatives and the Republican Party uh, landed up. So it is where it is. I think Rush, to a large extent, symbolizes kind of that shift. He started out as a Reagan optimist and ended up as a Trump pessimist, as a Trump conspiratorial just uh, pragmatist. One of the last things I remember us saying was that, oh, yeah, deficits don't really matter. We just make a big deal out of it when Democrats are in power, but we know it doesn't really matter. I don't know that he ever thought that when Democrats were in power, but it was one of his ways to rationalize his support of, of big government Trump. He started out, I think, as a, a football or baseball uh, commentator, sports commentator on local Radio, I think it's Sacramento. Um, yeah, Jennifer says he was a real hypocrite about drugs. He wanted them illegal, but then got away with illegal things himself, including drugs. I mean, he was he was um, he, he was part of the this uh, opioid epidemic. He he was taking painkillers for a long, long time. And you know, this is a guy who knows better and can afford to get treated for it, can afford to go off of it, but did not kick the habit for a long, long time and stayed on those drugs. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think like a lot of conservatives, the hypocrisy is there. Again, my great admiration for him was as a professional, as a pro, as somebody who pulled this off. I, I remember when Leonard Peikoff tried to do, uh, well, did a radio show, but tried to do it daily, three hours a day, just I, I think he tried two hours a day initially and how hard it was, and how exhausting it was, and how difficult it was for somebody like that to just be able to do it day in, day out, like clockworks, and keep his audience, grow his audience. Pretty impressive stuff. And he did provide me with quite a bit of entertainment and interest in those early days in the, I'd say, early 90s. So, you know, 
it was um, it was sad, in spite of our differences, in spite of his hypocrisy, and in spite of how he ended up politically, ideologically, philosophically. He was good at radio. He was good at radio. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at yourownbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>